Everybody, and welcome to the final episode of the first season of Huel's Gold. We made it. And I'm Alan. And I'm Chris. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah. All right. Yeah, who'd have thunk it, right? Made it 12 in. Only, uh, what, 330 to go? Who's keeping count? Us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meticulous count of all these crazy episodes that we got to do. Nah. No big deal. Yeah, whatever. Let's just uh, let's just start doing. Uh, Want to just just plop right in there? I was going to suggest that we switch this to a Grace Under Fire podcast, but <laughs> sure, we can stick to California's Gold. Yeah, I guess let's stick with it. But because it's the uh, the end of season one, we have the opportunity to do something a little little different for next week. Yeah, so we have a few things in the mix, but we can talk about those toward the end of the episode. Yeah. So everyone stick around. Mm-hmm. Or, or don't, and that's cool, too. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you do. Um, did you... You got the... I texted you the video of baskets this week. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. We posted for on... you, that was like many worlds that you like crossing. Yeah, to put it lightly. I think your text said my head is exploding. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I tweeted about it. I uh, Instagram posted... The video, holy cow! I mean, if you like threw a, like a like a rare private press record in the background, it <laughs> might as well be my show. Well, I guess Bakersfield's getting getting recognition somehow, right? Some way. Well, yeah. At least you know, Baskets isn't gonna talk about how we have like the third worst air and the. You're telling me that Baskets doesn't drive t- tourism here. No. No? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, let's uh let's just dive into this one cuz uh we're we're heading far up north this week. Where where are we at? We are at the La Sierra apparently because that's what the outline tells us. Yeah, what is that? What does that mean, you think? I don't know. It probably has something to do with the Lost Coast, you know, by Eureka, the area up there. But that's not even really where this is. Right, but the lost, I don't know. Uh, he kind Going of explains that. it a little bit in the uh, in the clip you're about to hear. Let, let's just see if he can uh, figure this one out for us. They're called the Sierra Buttes, 8,600 feet above sea level and spectacular. We got our first sight of them as we were heading down Gold Lake Highway to connect with State Route 49, which would take us to Downeyville. Now, I was beginning to think we'd never get there. And then all of a sudden, we looked off to the side, and there it was, nestled down in a quiet valley. Now, Downeyville is the county seat of Sierra County, and almost 400 people call it home. And driving into town, we knew immediately we were in for a treat. The main street lined with beautiful old buildings dating back to the 1850s. Back in the 1850s, Downeyville was a boom town. Caught right in the middle of gold rush fever, over 5,000 miners lived here. Set in one of the most rugged regions in the state, it was populated by rugged people, all of them hoping to strike it rich. Well, today, gold rush fever has quieted down quite a bit, and so has Downeyville. Most of the action these days takes place over at the courthouse or out on the benches in front of the Downeyville grocery store or on the sidewalks in front of the post office or the Sierra hardware store. Now, we pulled into town not knowing what to expect. And at first, when we were looking around, we saw lots of quaint, historic stores and houses, but not a lot of people. But after a few days, we discovered that Downeyville was full of people who were very proud of their little community and their way of life. So, yeah, uh, La Sierra or in Downeyville... I still, I still don't get that term though. I, 
Let's look it up. Yeah, we need to do some more research. Hold on. This is amazing. 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 Okay, we're back. Tell me what you found. Well, I have two, from a bit of searching, I have two explanations. Okay. Okay. I can't adjudicate between which one's right or wrong. I should give you both of them. One, it's named the La Sierra due to its relative lack of fame compared to Lake Tahoe and Yosemite. But to me, that doesn't sound like a... Does that sound like a historical reason? No, that sounds like a, something a chamber of commerce would have thrown together. Right, right. So No offense to the chambers out there. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. The other one is that it's the La Sierra because it refers to you know, the area they're talking about. Apparently because this area was lost when people abandoned it. I'm guessing they're talking about the gold miners. That Yeah, but that kind of goes against what Huel's saying, that this place was never abandoned. There were always people there. Didn't you say something like you thought it was the consciousness of California? Yeah, like I guess the people who have found it is the collective California consciousness. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> If either that, way, if that's, such a thing exists, either way, that's all we got on that thing. That's good enough. Uh, let's well, get. I to mean, t- you know what? How does Posi track on a Plymouth work? What? <laughs> it just does. Why do they call it Lost Hills? I Bro, don't know. How do you lose a hill? <laughs> it's old in them hills. They ain't losing them. Mm-mm. Uh, well, let's get to talking about this theme this week. What'd you think? About the kids? Yeah, those kids screaming. It, I'm, it's interesting to hear that many kids from ages 5 to, what, 18? Because there's K through yeah. 12? K 17 through 12. or 18? Yell. The theme song. That was interesting. Um, I thought I wasn't a fan. <laughs> Well, you, earlier you said you were a fan of the flute because you thought... It was I'm a, a fan of the flute, though. The flute was very cool. Well, I thought it... Well, I initially was a fan because I thought it was a flutophone. Yeah. So... I wonder... Because, you know, that, that, that instrument has two names. Flutophone. Mm-hmm. Recorder. Recorder, yeah. Are those... Wait, are those the same instrument? Yeah. Let's look it up. Hold on. This is amazing! Amazing! amazing. All right, what do we find? So they're generally similar, but flutophones can only play in the key of C when recorders have a greater range of notes. Right, because Hot Cross Buns was written in the key of C. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, Yeah, so not the best theme, maybe uh, aesthetically, but probably the most fun for Huel to get to do. Uh, did you notice any uh, any kids out there in the sea of like forty kids? <laughs> they meant this, the key of sea. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, they kind of blurred together. But I'm sure you did. Well, yeah, because there was that uh, bootleg Simpson shirt right there in the middle. So that's uh, two weeks running, right? That's we got that? Uh, that. We got that streak going right now. Yeah, it's the '90s. My friend Kevin would be ecstatic about that. <laughs> So we quite literally have a cold open here. Yeah. Hule's, <laughs> Hule's hanging on the ice. He's waddling a little bit. Yeah, uh, Hule's hanging out on Gold Lake, which is just a frozen lake in front of some snowy mountains. And it's a pretty cool shot. It's creative. And probably one of the more creative parts of this show. It's pretty... Uh, simplistic show there's not a whole lot going on here i mean of course there's great details to to mine um but as you heard in the clip downeyville has a population of about 400 people now it's been around a while and i'm gonna stop the presses right now because when we wa- when we're doing these shows oh man Dude, he's got oh, more. you thought you just saw one. <laughs> Wait a minute. One. What is that? Is that one too? I think that's one too. Oh, man. One, two, three, four. Okay. 
Okay. Had to make and sure. A, and a, a second separate thing. I'm going to bring up in a second. So when we do these shows, we have the episode kind of running in the background to remind us of things and to keep us on track. So Alan just re-went over the scene with the theme and he played it in slow motion and there's not one Simpson shirt. There's not but two. There's not three, but four Simpson <laughs> shirts. <laughs> oh man. And they're all different, different scenes. Two singular Barts, two whole families. This and is the, we can't really make out that one. Yeah, there, there might but be there a may, fifth. There may know. be a fifth. So the other thing I wanted to bring up in this crowd is there's a kid who, as the as the uh, the graphic of the the title rolls up, it kind of the C rolls right up over him. He's this quintessential kind of kid that I experienced throughout uh, my childhood, elementary years. I've I think other people have too. I know a friend of mine said that he lived next door to one of these kids. It's the kid with red hair who wears the gold satin uh, 49ers jacket. There's something about that kid, the combination of the red hair and the satin jacket. You never see those two things separate. Mm Mm-mm. I mean, you see plenty of red-headed kids. It's almost like you wear the jacket to compliment your look. Yeah. Right? I actually dressed up as one of these kids <laughs> for Halloween one year. <laughs> like, really exaggerated. What did, when people but... were asking you who you were, what did you say? It was a long story every time oh, okay. I had to answer. Okay. So it was kind of a mistake. Don't make your costumes be very specific jokes that only you understand right it doesn't work but anyway got a little sidetracked there with these uh simpson shirts but it's amazing that there's 400 people in downeyville and you gotta assume that maybe like a third of them are kids at the most Mm -hmm. and then that four of that third is wearing simpson shirts on the same day because you got to assume this probably wasn't like picture day where everyone knew that they had to wear stuff. He'll just showed up. Yeah, yeah. It is crazy. Oh man. But uh like most of these boom towns, uh, that's the kind of term called a boom town or a boom town. Boom. Like the the booming thunder we got going on <laughs> outside right now. Yeah, these boom towns had a uh, huge populations at one time. He will mention five thousand people once lived in Downeyville, um, and they were rugged. And you know, I've done a lot of California history research in my day, and I think when people talk about these rugged miners and their fast living and lack of church and all this stuff, these were just like gnarly dudes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they run off to go live across a country that it takes them a whole year to get to, to go look for gold. There's no, there's no wives telling them what to do. There's no churches yet. That's a whole nother thing that happened in these mining towns. It's crazy. No, it's wild. I would not do it. No. California, here I go. (laughs) Get me out of here. Oh man. Now, these guys these guys are wild for yeah. sure. But uh Downeyville seems like a pretty sleepy town now. Super sleepy. Yeah. He'll even mention that it took him a few days to see some people. <laughs> <laughs> that seems amazing because he was there for quite a while. Uh how long did he say he was there? At so at the end he said they stayed there for 8 days. 8 days. And it took him a few to see some people. <laughs> I'm hoping that's just part of the narrative. Yeah. And sure. I mean, he also says that, I think we're just repeating the clip here, but it's funny that he said that one of the places that people were hanging out was the benches out front of the grocery store. I've never seen benches out front of a grocery store, uh, like maybe a bus bench in our maybe. in our bustling metropolis of Bakersfield. Right, I think here. Young's had one. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> 
the one on Niles. But anyway. That's... But uh, speaking of the people, he'll finally hear or find some. And of course, that's the favorite part of this show is when he gets to yuck it up with people. Mm-hmm. So right off the bat, he finds like the most spot on real life Ron Swanson I've ever seen. Yeah. And he's a sheriff. Is that what he said? Highway patrolman. Highway patrolman. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And got a Caltrans worker and a highway patrolman. And the, yeah, they're at the, the volunteer firefighters house or whatever. And unfortunately, I mean, we get the quote of the episode, I think right off the bat, right off the bat. He says, you'll just ask him, what are you doing? Yeah. Or do you do this all the time? Or that's the gist of what he was getting at. Mm -hmm. And the guy says, we all have lives of our own. (laughs) (laughs) It seems like the kind of answer that a like small town, Northern California, like hermity kind of guy would say. Right. He's just like, let me just have my simple green. (laughs) That is simple green. (laughs) Um, But this guy, yeah, definitely Ron Swanson, you know. Most people, I'm sure, know who that is from Parks and Recreation. I think they both have uh, chewing tobacco on their lips, too, mm-hmm. which kind of like adds to the mystique of their their ruggedness, the mm-hmm. current ruggedness. But uh, next... Uh, How about the geese lady? Yeah, the geese lady. I wish we got names for these people. Yeah, they're just on the side of one of the two rivers that runs through the town. And Huel just comes up and just... What's the deal with these geese? <laughs> and she had a great uh, description for them. What was what was that? Their community property. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> you can sell them as a community. You can. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. Is it like a fleet of buses? <laughs> it's just three geese hanging out. Just three. Yeah, that's yeah. the best part of it. <laughs> What does that equal amongst 400 people? Oh, splitting it up? Yeah. Well, we got to we gotta do the math. Okay, hold on. We got to do math. This is amazing. 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 All right, we did the math. That's 133.33. What does that mean? <laughs> it's one geese per 133.33 people. Oh, so... Each person gets one 133rd of a goose. Right. All right. Hey, still community property. It's like a feather per person. (laughs) Can make a pen out of it, I guess. Uh, So from there, well, she feeds the geese these, these two single pieces of bread that she has here. I guess she forgot to make a sandwich. Um, (laughs) Maybe she was about to make a sandwich and heel came up. And she's like, I said, oh, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I, guess, I guess I got to go feed the community property. Is that taxpayer bread there? <laughs> so from the goose lady, we go to the museum. It's just museum. <laughs> it doesn't say anything else on the place but museum. I love it. And it, it- kind of gives me more of like a antique store vibe yeah it has the horseshoe you just kind of walk around it the uh-huh. way it's laid out mm-hmm. with display cases mm-hmm. plus did you notice everything has tags on it I, i'm sure they're just like information tags but it gives this right. like the price tag feel of, of an antique <laughs> store the thing that Huel was so enamored with the uh horse snowshoe i didn't get it did you no but it, maybe he spent about 30 minutes in here and he finally found something that was Okay, I could do something with this. Yeah. Horseshoe. Yeah. Or snowshoe. I mean, that's what I'm going with. Because if he spent eight days there and a horse snowshoe made it into the, the eclipse, into the Downeyville segment. Yeah. I'm going to guess this is, you got to work with something. Well, you pays your money, it takes your chances. <laughs> Right, so where where are we where are we going next? Well, it's funny. I was talking about the no churches thing, but whoops. <laughs> well, is... I'm sure that the gold rush days there were a couple years before this oldest Protestant church in the in the continental 
United States. Well, we don't know that, right? It's it's going to oh, be decided yeah. based on a card game. That seems like so- okay. So this church that Huell visits claims to be the oldest Protestant church in continuous use in California. Which and, I, well, I well, did you notice that Huell does his thing where he doesn't he doesn't buy it? Pure skepticism. Yeah, it's it's funny. He did, it was the uh, center of California episode. When they say, hey, we're the center of California. He's like, how do you know? That's the whole basis of that episode. Right? And so it, we'll get to that. Yeah. But uh, a few down the, the road. The lady just gives him back, oh, we just know because my grandpa told me. He's like, yeah, but how did he know? <laughs> he just like smashes this lady's. Hugh's <laughs> like, investigative oh. journalism chops kind of come into play sometimes. Yeah, it's pretty good. So he. But yeah, the deck of cards thing, what was that? He just said this the Church of the Wayfarer in Carmel. Mm hmm. That's in the running for being the oldest Protestant church. Well, how was that? How was that decided? As we said, a card game. How, why are these? Why are these uh, ministers playing cards <laughs> <laughs> over historical fact? <laughs> Doesn't seem very uh, logical to do that. Well, they're just having fun. Uh, whatever. So we'll just go with it. It's the All oldest right. one. Okay. Until we hear otherwise, we'll go with it. The minister also, okay, so he kind of looks like me in, I don't know, two years. He doesn't look that much older than me. <laughs> no. But um, he has a bunch of pocket stuff. It's not quite the glasses holder that's been a running gag in the show so far. What is that, a checkbook? Looks like a checkbook. Could it be a pocket New Testament? Whoa. He's a pretty, that's tall and thin. Yeah, yeah maybe. I don't know, is, the kid, is the kid wearing Cortez's though? Yeah, this is long before Heaven's Gate though, so <laughs> that 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 shoe had not gone out of style yet. Oh man! So okay. Well, this is the next segment, or I should say, scene in the yeah, segment yeah. is. I'm guessing your favorite, just by your reaction. By far, so you get two things going on. Yeah. One, I'll just mention one. You get the fish stick band jacket coming in hot. And an added accessory that we haven't really mentioned before. He's worn them a couple times, but those Andrew WK jeans that he's got on (laughs) is so good. He's ready to party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When it's time to party, we will party hard. (laughs) Second thing uh, is this kid, man. This kid is hilarious to me. Yeah. Because, okay, I said this to you earlier. If you took this kid... Close your eyes, right? You just close your... Well, you'd have to, like, notch his voice down a couple octaves, but say you take the kid out and you put, like, a 63-year-old guy who's, like, been retired for a year and a half and he's starting to, uh, like, see the beauty in the world Mm -hmm. for the first time since he's got time on his hands... Uh. It would be the same conversation had. Seven-year-old kid, we don't get his name, talking about Willoughby's, which I don't even know what the heck he's talking about. Right. Is, is, it, is it the river or is it... Is it that rock? The rock? Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, this little kid in a striped long sleeve shirt tucked in, who did that when they were seven, brings Huel down to the river to see Willoughby's. And he doesn't really explain what that is. It's just the river, and it's where they swim at the river. Mm-hmm. All right. Cool. Yeah. And I, my favorite part about the kid mm-hmm. is he takes a breath in the middle of talking. <laughs> yeah. He does have some little kidism. <laughs> <laughs> While he's talking about the litter and the sheriff coming down and all right, that stuff. Right, he, but he says he calls them city people that did it. Yeah. He says, Sheriff talked to them, and... <laughs> They're not littering no more. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what happened, but but he also he'll gives this kid a question. Yeah, he says, "Wow, this is like better than a pool." He said, "Yeah, it's cleaner." I, I forget exactly what he says, but yeah, yeah. it's cleaner. And there's there's fish. <laughs> so I don't know how you compare that to a pool of fish. Well, you know about pools. Yeah, Have you ever dude. seen fish in them? Yeah. You want a little little pool let's, sidebar? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so uh, little little family secret. 
we clean pools. It's our family business, or at least has been a while. Uh, and one of the things that happens, at least here, is during the winter, people let their pools go completely green, swampy, gross. And one thing that that tends to proliferate uh, is mosquitoes, mosquito larva. So yeah. what? Yeah. So we have the the county vector control here, and their uh, solution for that is they. Will go around. It will though if they get complaints, or they'll do backyard checks, any which way that they can find pools that have stagnant water, and they have these little dissolving bags full of tiny carp. No, <laughs> I don't know what species they are, but these little fish, and they'll just toss them over people's fences into the pool. Because when we first started, we would clean these gross swamp pools up, and there'd be fish in there, and we thought it was some sort of like immaculate thing happening. Like we didn't know how these fish were Just like a spontaneous. Yeah. Fish. Yeah. But then we figured it out. So yes, plenty of times I've seen fit. Cause sometimes if they let pools go a couple of years, they'll get six, eight inches. Hmm. It's like a little pond back there. That's crazy. It turns into a natural habitat. There you go. Well, little Timmy was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was onto something then. Yeah. I think I'm going to call those fish Willem bees from now on. Willem bees. After uh, I like it. After this, whatever whatever it is he's talking to Huel about. In the next bit, they talk. So Huel's talking to a lady who mentions that there are zero addresses in Downeyville. Yeah. Which is, I have only come across this one other time. And I am not a world traveler. But there was an instance where we visited some friends in Ireland. And it was the same way. When they when there was a package sent, the male person would just know who it is and take it to your house. Hmm. Just na- the name of the community generally is all you had to know. So I never heard of, about that. I never the same, heard of Same similar this. thing in California, though. The only thing I ever have to equate that to is... When I was a kid, I liked to write letters to celebrities to get autographs and stuff. And I, I wonder if that was weird. Do you think that... Did... That's not normal, for sure. Okay. Um, I would write letters to celebrities based on addresses I would find on the burgeoning internet. So rarely <laughs> were they correct. But I wanted to write the president and get the president's autograph. And I asked my mom... I was probably, I don't know, nine... Where does the president live? I know it's the White House, but what's the address? And she says, oh, don't worry about it. Just put the president, the White House, and it'll get there. No way! I was freaking out, because I thought I was going to waste a stamp. Uh, Turns out, good old Billy Clinton did get my letter, or at least his uh, secretary did, and uh, sent me a nice fake autograph. Nice. A nice uh, little card with the presidential seal and an embossed, obviously not real autograph. So that kind of wraps us up in Downeyville. Mm -hmm. Huel, take us to our next destination, please. Let us have it. Hi, Liz. Hey, Joe. How's it going? It's great. See, the cat is still in good shape. Brought you another uh, mountain messenger, pike pole. Is this a good time to ask for a raise? <laughs> I guess not, huh? No, I don't think so. Well, I'll see what you think I of this one here. Money either. When Joe Sharp turns in his newspaper column every week to his editor, Liz Fisher, yeah. it's a big deal. Because you see, the paper in which it appears is not just any old paper. It's been around a while. In fact, it's been around since 1853, which makes it the oldest weekly newspaper in the entire state of California. It's called the Mountain Messenger, and it's published in Downeyville. The newspaper office is downtown on the second floor of a building which is well over 100 years old itself. This is kind of where the stuff really gets done, isn't it? This is it. Now, we happened to drop by on a Tuesday morning, and there was all kinds of activity going on. In fact, the entire staff was busy getting the newspaper ready to go to press the next day. 
lots of cutting and pasting and typing. And when you talk about the staff of the Mountain Messenger, you're talking about Liz Fisher, the editor, and Virginia Collins, the typesetter. That's it. They, along with the newspaper cat named Top Cat, who pretty much has the run of the place, do the whole thing themselves. Uh, okay. Yeah. Homeboy's jokes. Yeah. It it it, it kind of remind it's it's so obvious that he just felt the camera there, like he was just playing it up to me. I, I was mentioning to you that I thought that Tommy Wiseau would have written this scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's like just a poorly acted scene because he's it's obvious the camera's there and he's trying to trying to be funny, but the jokes don't aren't even delivered at the right pace. No, because he's got. Am one, I gonna like, raise? <laughs> he's got like four jokes in 60 seconds and leaves no room for laughs. Not that there is any, but I think maybe the fact that he like acknowledges the cat, much like, uh, Tommy Wiseau does in the room, the, when flower, he, scene. the flower shop scene. <laughs> it's a weird way to open this oldest newspaper or oldest continuously run weekly newspaper. Stressing that weekly newspaper in the state, the Mountain Messenger, which started in 1853. It's it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. You know, we have a historic newspaper here too, the Bakersfield California, and started as a Kern County Courier as a weekly mountain town newspaper, but it morphed into a daily a daily reader. Mm-hmm. But this still seems to be have maintained its like weekly mountain paper aesthetic where it's like what did she say that they don't really put kind of any national news very much? Yeah, cuz I mean when you she shows you a few of the I guess sample papers or whatever it's people's kids. Yeah. And just sort of local news and things like that. It just sounds like a gossip sheet. Maybe, yeah. Some of our Gossip Girl friend fans would appreciate this, maybe. It's a mountain version of Gossip Girl. Um, that giant machine. Yeah, what is that? that? The, I mean, I'm going to guess it's a typesetting machine. I, I've yeah, because never... she's the typesetter. It makes sense. But to, we get, I don't even know how to describe this thing because it's like maybe the size of like a, a piano. It's like a big, bulky, black metal machine and the the typesetter for the mountain messenger is sitting there typing out the articles and there isn't really much of a display beyond just this small little like scrolling window that's maybe what like a half an inch big with Mm -hmm. this red like it looks like it looks like the kind of script that uh the terminator would see in his vision (laughs) um it's a, it's a crazy machine, and you said earlier, there's got to be a lot of uh, typos going. Dude, there has to be a lot. Well, I mean, of, well, first of all, if you admit to it, that's already not exactly, a good sign. She did. Right? She did. It. Oh, of course. Yeah. And then she gets to the thing. I catch as many as I can, but if it's Wednesday, we do. You feel that crunch. Yeah, you feel the crunch, and it's best just to get the paper out. You do well to get the paper out, I think, is what she said. Well, plus with that little Terminator script, like, how can she even really read what she's typing? She's kind of just going by, by, by feel, I guess, of the keyboard. Like, ah, that didn't feel like a typo. And I know that they feel like their jobs are important too, but at some point, I mean, the editor mentions twice how little she gets paid. Yeah. That she has a second job just to afford this first job. Yeah. That so it doesn't sound like smart, uh, smart life planning. Uh, uh, well, she mentioned she got the kids out of the house and she can afford to live poor. Yeah, what was she like a civil engineer or something? It's construction engineer. Construction I think. engineer. She got the kids out of college now. Now to uh, live a life of poverty. <laughs> I guess she's uh, usually the opposite. Yeah, she's doing uh, what the Constitution told her she should, and that's mm-hmm. the freedom of the press by telling about how uh, Cindy got married to Philip. <laughs> it was Linda, I think, because that was the. Uh, that was the typo that you caught. Yeah. 
There was no space between uh, like I and Linda or something. Yeah. So oh well. Rammed them together. What about Top Cat? Yeah. What's there to say about That's old it. Top Nothing. Cat? Just it's he's top. hanging out. That's it. He only mentions the cat three times. Uh, I'm pretty sure that he hangs out in that black paper tray right above the, the typesetting machine. Yeah. He just sits in That's, there. Uh, what else are you going to do in this like cramped, dusty office? I mean, there isn't much to it. It's a this is a old, really short little segment here. It's short and it's cool at the same time. Uh huh. Move on to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, hey, Huel. Meet you at the mountaintop. It's fast, it's fun, and it's one of our favorite winter pastimes here in California. And nowadays, it's state-of-the-art, too, with snow plows and ski lifts and all the conveniences. Thousands of happy skiers can be found on slopes like these in Squaw Valley in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Now, these days, it's all kind of glamorous, but it wasn't always this way. Are they ready or what? And what we're looking at is history in the making. Because back in the mid-1800s, just 70 miles north of the present-day Squaw Valley Ski Resort, the first organized ski racing in the entire Western Hemisphere took place when some rugged and rather adventuresome gold miners strapped on 14-foot-long skis and hit the slopes. And as part of our Lost Sierra adventure, we traveled from Sierra County to adjoining Plumas County to visit the area where all this took place over 130 years ago. Specifically, we headed up to Plumas Eureka State Park near the tiny community of Johnsville. Our group included Eleanor Redstreak, a Plumas County resident whose late husband was a world-famous long skier. We were met by Park Superintendent Dave Nelson, who gave us a tour of the ski museum they've set up and filled us in on the history of those early California skiers. So this this commercial at the beginning, uh, I don't know where they got the clip this from. Footage, yeah, the footage, yeah. I'm almost positive. So you heard the little weird, like kind of song into talking about modern skiing and then going into this like old timey long old wooden skis. So the visuals of it are so wild because it looks like a like a Lake Tahoe commercial. It, yeah, it's why it's. It's like if they took all the skies from Johnny Tsunami <laughs> <laughs> and their parents, and they made a commercial out of it. So I had a different reference to this, because I'm pretty sure this is the same like stock footage that they used in Wayne's World for like half a second at towards the beginning of the movie, uh, Benjamin, played by Rob Lowe, is in bed with a lady. Uh, I'm sure they were just taking a quick nap. Um, and she's flipping through the channels. Before she gets to Wayne's World, there's like a little clip of skiing. And the the little voiceover on this commercial or something just says, they are very fast. <laughs> and that's just all I had to go on as far as skiing my whole childhood is that it's really fast. Well, if we would have watched this, we would know that skiing... It's not very fast. No, it can be. It can be. Maybe um, not. Maybe not on these big old. Uh, what did you? What did you call these things? They're like, <laughs> like planks for a fence, or like, like a, a fence, fence board. Fence board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's basically what these are. Uh, but it's interesting that California really does seem to have everything because the fact that where we Johnsville in the Plumas Eureka State Park. And there's a ski museum up there. Mm-hmm. There's museums for everything in this state. Right. Got the Surf Museum, Santa Cruz. Yeah. Now we have another, well, I guess this is a precursor to the more extreme versions. Yeah. Ski museum. There was just museum uh, two segments prior. 
with the the snowshoe. Maybe it was a horse, s- horse snowshoe museum. But they only had one. Mm, good point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the trip into the museum is interesting in that it's very rustic and kind of reminds me of some local museums that we got around here that we may be uh, hitching a ride to to uh, do some maybe some uh, live segments in some upcoming episodes. Just a little teaser there. But uh, the whole dope thing. Yeah, doping was a thing. Dope is king. It's just it's just yeah. ski wax. <laughs> it's, it's nothing it's crazy. Just... They made such a big deal about it, though. Like they're all those ingredients, and they showed that recipe for it and everything. Yeah, I think. Well, they were talking about that. The purse was worth what a hundred hundred dollars? Is that what he said? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And oh, which is a ton of money back then. Back then, yeah, just for like skiing, quick. Yeah, so they called them yeah dope kings. It's got a different connotation these days. Yeah, it's a little different. Um, California's a little more wild these days. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I will tell you that we had skateboarding. You have your own kind of dope. Yeah. It's just wax Mm -hmm. for the curb. We used to go to the 88 Cent Plus store. (laughs) Okay. It's East Side Special over there? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The the 99 Cents had it taken. Had the name, name taken. And we would buy glass candles. Mm-hmm. And you would uh, go to, a, well, we would safely do this into a garbage can, but you break it and you take the, the candle out because it's only 88 cents. Wax the curb with it. There you go. And that worked the same? Yeah. And sometimes you try to use soap because we were cheap, and that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> yeah, because that'll just rinse off. You see, like dumb kids putting like Dawn <laughs> soap on there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. It's a well, wonder you didn't we break were, your we face. Were, well, we were kids, so. Yeah. Um, this guy there, uh, did he, did they give a name? Oh, big Rob Russell. Yeah, that's right. Um, he's going to like demonstrate this skiing technique because the museum loaned him a couple pairs of these skis and he's going on about how they go 80 miles an hour and they use this big old pole as a brake and all this stuff. But he doesn't seem very confident. No, it becomes obvious very quickly that he everything he knows he read in a book (laughs) well he says that right off the bat he's like well i read that and he's just kind of holding things as if he's never held them before right he said well in principle yeah (laughs) this is supposed to serve as a break yeah and the first pass is it's um how would you describe it? I mean, Huell said, how do I put this diplomatically? Yeah. That's how he starts it. Because uh, cause he said that these guys would be whizzing past at 80 miles an hour. And then Huell says he didn't have to worry about catching him because he wasn't going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> and in the clip, you definitely see. I mean, he looks off. Like, I mean, look He's at struggling it. to go two. Yeah, he's off balance. It looks like he just... He just went to roll a rama and popped the skates on for the first time. Yeah. Because you, you're going to start walking. He started walking with these yeah, giant yeah. planks anyway. Well, because he didn't dope up. No, they popped some dope on it. <laughs> they, they they dope the skis. Yeah. And go for a second pass. Much more. He's up to like seven miles an hour this time, but at least it's like a constant motion. Yeah. And just like the way they hold that, it's like a jousting. I know. It's funny. The whole thing is pretty pretty comical, but you know, it's gotta be it's gotta be exhilarating. They are very fast. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> his face when he breaks, because you know, he's got this big pole thing that he puts between his legs and he kinda it, it's almost like a like what are those the uh, those like toy horse things that kids get? Yeah. Uh it's- He's almost like riding it like that, but he's got this oh, 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 kind of face. <laughs> <laughs> Dude is so scared. Uh, and then the face just turns to once he stopped. Instant. I did it. I did it. I did it. It's good. But again, this is like this. 
this is a pretty short segment too, because what can you say about this whole thing here? Um, it almost seemed like the show was going to like run short at first, right? Yeah. Which it kind of did. Uh, cause we're already at the end of like the actual show body. But one of my theories just got exploded. Got exploded. Uh, he was wearing the trench at his little outro segment. And last week, if you remember, I said that I theorized that his wardrobe was geographically specific. Mm-hmm. That the trench was specifically a San Francisco uh, like item of clothing. Or even just, you know, like a, a coastal, a coastal coat. He's far from the coast here. Yeah, he's staying in the snow. Yeah. Next to like a barbed wire fence. This couldn't be more old west winter right, right here. Right. Except for his mock his red mock turtleneck. Isn't I like that he just wears a red turtleneck yeah. with a green trench coat in the <laughs> But either way, I still think the trench primarily is a coastal coat. Let's just call it a Northern California coat, because then you'd be safe still. I, I gotta come clean. Okay, okay. In lots of visiting episodes, which always take place in L.A., he wears the trench all the time. Okay, so... I'm busted. Dang. I feel like a Huel noob. Where were you keeping that information? This is Huel's gold. It's not visiting Huel. This is Huel's gold. It's Huel. It's, I know it's all-encompassing to Huel shows, and we may be... Whoa, whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? We may do other... Things besides California. Don't school. put words in my mouth. That's where you're going with it. I said we may visit other California's gold locales mm-hmm. on a road trip while sitting on a bench in California's golden parks while drinking California's water in a California <laughs> mission. <laughs> I think I got them all. I think that's yeah, all that's the Huel shows. Uh, but the show's not over. No, we get. Old Theta Brown. Yeah. Pops on in there. She's a well known piano teacher in Plumas County. And I thought this was gonna be like another uh double doozer theme week, but we get like two seconds of it before Huel starts blabbing about stuff over top of it. So we're not playing that. You gotta deal with the kids again at the end of this episode. But you see some amateur pictures of the snow because mm-hmm. because Huel mentions that there wasn't much snow, although it looked like when he was this out the outro, yeah, with the trench, there's quite a, quite a bit of snow there. So maybe it was one of the last days. Maybe it was the eighth day. It was actively snowing when he's doing it, though. Right. But yeah, he, there's these pictures of snowy times from years past. But then we get this little bonus segment at the end, which I don't know why it wasn't inc- included, but. Did it not fit well? I don't know. It's the season finale. He's trying to like get a little cliffhanger going. But, I mean, yeah, I get it. It's a little kind of just a little funny little bit here. But it's a, it's a decent clip, though. Yeah, yeah. So Huel's talking with the sheriff of Sierra County, the second smallest county as far as population in California at that time. Because 75% of it is a national forest. Exactly. Okay. Say, say, they say that a few times. Yeah, yeah. So the big the big reveal is that they are standing at an intersection of two highways at the only traffic light in the whole county. And it's not even like a regular traffic light. Just a blinking red light. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it. And... After the sheriff kind of heads out for a second, we get the these people who live at that intersection, and these are some good characters here because oh yeah, the the wife, the wife is just kind of telling this story. About, wait wait wait, did you? See, it's the only car you see pass when Huel is talking to Lee, the sheriff, Sheriff uh-huh. Lee. You see that I don't know half ton white truck make a left turn, <laughs> and. You know, it seems like a pretty quick left turn, whatever. 
And Lee he just kind of, he does the whole, not even a wave, it's just the hand hey. in front of your body, lazy fingers. Hey. <laughs> he obviously knows, uh, you know, Conrad as he goes by. <laughs> Conrad. <laughs> hey. Or he was telling him, like, hey, dude, slow down. We're at the traffic light. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Sheriff. <laughs> um, just a surfer. <laughs> <laughs> but as I was saying, the wife it just has her hands full of binders and papers and some weird little, uh, I don't know what this is. It's like a little ceramic shoehorn or something. Why is, it, why is she laughing the whole time? I don't know. She is giggled. She's tickled pink. As they say, and uh, her husband just throws that sheriff right under the bus. Oh yeah. Well, they they mentioned that no one ever stops here. Yeah, the only stoplight, no one stops. And he said the only time the sheriff is around when you're here. Yeah. It's, Whoa. <laughs> They've obviously been calling the sheriff like, "Hey, what's his name? Roy? Roy? No, the sheriff? Yeah, Lee. Lee. Where did I get Roy? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that Lee. Hey, Lee." We got trucks blasting through here. Conrad's taking these left turns so hard. Uh, all right, guys, I'll be out there. What? Huel's there. <laughs> he just stands at all board. <laughs> <laughs> Slow it down, Conrad. Oh, man. But it's a fun way to end the segment, or the show, actually. And it's a good way to end the season. Yeah, nice and, nice and slow. Yeah. Nice and smooth. But uh, I think what we decided on for next week, for spring break, is the grab bag. It's a bonus episode, surprise episode. And we're doing this in between seasons. Yes. Okay. So this will not be the start of season two next week. This is a bonus episode. Don't even know what it's going to be until the second you click on the button, however you play the show. Should I not even list it in the description? Like a like an airhead? <laughs> like a mystery airhead? <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be so good for uh like uh, new listeners start off with this mystery show or they're feeling adventurous, they'll just It's a mystery vortex. All you need to know is that we're going to pick an interesting episode and it may come out of visiting road trip the bench. <laughs> not as likely. Video log. Probably not because we don't have access. Right. Right. Okay. California's Golden Park. You got to leave it missions. hanging, dude. Come on. Dude, I mean, we may even throw out the happy world of Huel Hauser oh, from the 70s whoa. in Tennessee. You never know. So uh, stick around for that. But uh, the baskets episode this week. I think we need to talk about that before we go. Yeah. How about that? That was a lot of that was a lot of convergence happening for you. Yeah. Of interest in life. So let me I I need to create a little bubble map here of all the connections. So we got Baskets. TV show based in Bakersfield. Not filmed in Bakersfield, unfortunately. Come on down, guys. There's lots of cool stuff for you to do, and we'll probably get a good price on those filming locations. Whatever. You got uh, Christine, who's played by Louis Anderson, watching the, I think it's the road trip, it's the Bakersfield road yep. trip episode yep. where he goes to wool growers, which is a great episode. Mm -hmm. And it's funny cause he will act very surprised about the, the Basque restaurant that's mentioned in it, even though. We know that Huel went to Noriega's, another local bass restaurant, like 20 years before. And he also went to Wool Growers a bunch of times like, on his own. Anyway, so Huel in the show, in the fictional Bakersfield, watched by a character who is played by Louis Anderson, who I named Louis the Dog after. It's, it's a lot. And, and on top of it, in the clip... The the clip in the show, there's a woman, there's a waitress. Uh, back in the day, I would frequent a restaurant in town that she worked at. And she waited on me like literally a hundred times. It's one of the few people that I personally have known and have uh, had contact with that met Huel. 
There's only like two or three people in the whole world that huh. I can say that about. That's crazy. It freaked me out. I loved it. No, it was a lot. Yeah. I think in your text to me, you said, like, your head's going to explode. Head's explode. And... Something along those lines. Yeah. Which is crazy. Do you think a basket drives uh, tourism here? I think so. Hmm. Because one thing, because I actually saw Louis Anderson do a comedy show in Bakersfield, and he mentioned how much he likes Bakersfield in real life. He had been there a couple times before, and that he never wants to show Bakersfield in a negative light in the show. If anything ever comes up of that, he he tries to like suppress it in the show. Who knows if that's really true? But he said it, and it was nice. And yeah, people come here, right? Looking I think for so. uh, looking for the baskets, family rodeo, and stuff that doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah, but it was a pretty cool little Huel Huel tidbit this week. Um. You know, got to keep Huel's spirit alive. That's what we're doing here. So is uh, Zach Galifianakis, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that was a cool, a cool little blip, little blip on the radar. The, the Huel universe. Yeah, is that what you would call it? The Huleverse. The Huleverse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <clears throat> well, I think that's going to wrap up another one, and. Uh, Get ready for that bonus episode. It's going to be a good one. But until then, we just hope that you come along with us next time as we continue our search for Hughes Gold. Gold. Now, where do you go swimming? Oh, just right out here. See, there's a rock, you know, this rock, a lot. Usually it's a lot higher. Uh huh. And see, um, people will just dive right off those rocks. So you dive off up here? Yeah. See, this one's called the Daredevil Rock because, you know, a lot of snakes hang around it here and they just want to jump over it and it's real neat. Well, this is better than a swimming pool. Yeah, it is. A lot bigger and a lot nicer. You get to see a lot more fish. Look how clean the water yeah. is. There's no pollution here at no, all. No, no, no people like to pollute here. I mean, it's just beautiful. I think when city people come up here, once people did throw trash in here, but they, um, the sheriff came over and had a talk with them, and that was the end of that. <laughs>